So our Mauryan householder had a number of religions to choose from, like Jainism. Mahavira, um, one of the founders of, of Jainism, had been a very well-to-do man. He had born in, into a republic near Vishali. Perhaps he'd married a princess and had children. In general, he was a man on the up and up. But at the age of 30, he left his family behind him to become an ascetic. He wandered around naked, attacked by humans and animals alike. Then, one day, in a field by a river, he became all-knowing. He saw the way to achieve moksha, escaping the cycle of birth and rebirth. Mahavira had become a victor over pride and greed. Hunger, thirst, sleep, fear, disease no longer affected him. And he joined a long line of ford crossers who tell humanity how to achieve moksha. And he founded a community to disseminate his teaching. And his followers were Jains. Jain means victor. Today, we're interested in what life was like as an ancient Jain in this community brought together by Mahavira. And life was tough. You can get a sense of this just by the name Jain. Think about the name Buddhist. This comes from Buddha, which means enlightened one. Buddha offered a middle way to get to moksha without going through extreme asceticism or uh, extreme um, enjoyment of the world, an easier path to salvation. But compare this to Jain. This comes from Jinnah, which means victor or hero. Mahavira offered no middle way to moksha. To be a Jain, you have to perform acts of heroic asceticism. You have to become a hero with complete control of your body and mind. What heroic acts of asceticism did you have to perform? Well, if you were a Jain monk or nun, you'd start with the five great vows. Non-violence, or ahimsa. Truthfulness, non-stealing, non-acquisition, and chastity. Mahavira's claim was that by following these, we can live in such a way that we don't gain any more karma, and the karma we have disappears, leaving us able to enter moksha. Ahimsa, non-violence, is the really central vow. And in Jainism, the requirement for, uh, for non-violence is very strict indeed, much stricter than the Buddhist or Brahminical equivalents. Many Jains, um, monks or nuns, wear face masks just in case a fly enters their mouth by accident. And then not to shave in case that kills lice. Instead, you have to pluck out your hair. And then not to light lamps because a moth could be attracted to it into the flame and die. And the ancient Vedic sacrifices, well, they're right out. Even sacrificing a dough model replacement, like many people were doing in the Mauryan era, is no good. Actually, the other five great vows are equally strict. Take the vow of chastity, for example. A Jain monk or nun is not to even think about sex. And sometimes, when an ancient Jain reached the end of their life, they would go and find a quiet spot, usually in a cave. They would sit down, they would meditate, and they would fast. They'd fast all the way to death. Chandragupta Maurya, the first of the Mauryan emperors, did this, and it still happens today. Not all Jains became monks or nuns. Plenty of them remained lay worshippers. In fact, unlike Buddhism, the lay worshippers became a part of the Sangha the formal Jain community. Becoming a monk was much harder if you were a Jain, but being part of the Sangha was rather easier. You could do it without leaving your home and becoming ascetic. The lay worshippers uh, took the five vows only in a slightly less rigorous form. For example, the vow of chastity. Jain monks couldn't think of sex. Jain hearers should avoid sex after they've had children. Perhaps because Jain lay worshippers are allowed into the Sangha, into the formal community, Jainism flourished in ancient India. It flourished especially in South India and in Sri Lanka. Patronised by emperors, one of the four great sects with uncounted numbers of followers. Nowadays, Jainism is a pretty small religion. Fewer than 1% of Indians are Jains, and only about 250,000 people here in the UK. But the community brought together by Mahavira still exercises a huge amount of influence.